So, we continue in the biggest book in the Bible, um, Isaiah. It's a long one. There's a lot going on. And for almost 35 straight chapters, we have been in poetry, which as I've been with many of you, whether it's in small groups or we've just been talking about Isaiah casually, uh, you have, uh, we have uh, said together, man, poetry's rough. Uh, really would have been helpful if God just uh, went with another form. It was a little clearer, a little bit more straightforward. But here we are, 35 straight chapters of, of, of poetry, and now we come to chapter 36, which for a brief moment is prose and an actual sort of recognizable story being told. And so we, we read uh, together at the beginning of uh, chapter 36. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of summarizing as we read through this, but in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah, which is the southern region of Israel, and he took them. And the king of Assyria sent his field general to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army behind him, and he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway uh, to the washer's field. And there came out to uh, Sennacherib's uh, general, Hezekiah's staff, and Sennacherib's field general said to them, Say to Hezekiah, This is what the great king, the king of Assyria, has to say. On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Imagine all of the great epic standoffs in history. Uh, Two fighters face off before they get into the ring together. Team captains sizing each other up before a game. Two armies lining up face to face across the battlefield from each other. Here, the king of Assyria and the king of Judah, they send out their emissaries uh, to face off against each other, but it's really not much of a contest. The Assyrian officer has an entire army uh, backing him up. And at this point, the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, have been sort of reduced to this single city and, and their military lives within these walls. And the Assyrian officer, with his army behind him, uh, announces, begins to call Judah to give up. And, and he does this in an interesting way by saying the exact same thing that Isaiah has been preaching in Jerusalem, that Israel's God is the one who has called Assyria to come against the city. It's always a bit awkward when your pagan enemies start sounding like your prophets. You know you're in trouble. And that's one of the most difficult aspects about the threat that Judah faces. A couple weeks ago, I said that the people need to figure out the difference between what is true and what is almost true. And almost every single thing that the Assyrian officer says is true. Hezekiah cannot deliver the people of Jerusalem. Egypt cannot rescue them. God is the one who has brought Assyria against them. These are all things that, Assyria, that, that Isaiah has already said. But then the Assyrian officer takes the truth and he turns it into a bit of clever propaganda. So stay with me as I, as I, I give a little bit of background. Hezekiah is the king and he has a reputation for being a bit of a reformer king. God had given the Israelite people the temple in Jerusalem as the place where they were supposed to worship him. But as the years went along, as time went on, uh, the people began to build shrines or, or altars kind of all throughout the land. These were places that were dedicated to God so that the people could worship God 
really in a convenient way that didn't require them to travel up to Jerusalem uh, to go through the hassle of either bringing their offerings with them or carrying money and exchanging it for animals once they got to Jerusalem. It, it was about convenience, largely. God's people have a fairly long history of worshiping God according to what's easiest, what, what feels good or right as opposed to how God has asked them to worship him. And the book of Chronicles tells us uh, this way, that God's instructions for worship, the, the instructions that we find uh, in the first books of the Bible, were neglected for, for really hundreds of years between King Solomon, the son of King David, all the way through to Hezekiah. And so Hezekiah is the one who, who goes on a mission to restore worship in God's temple, to call people to come, to return to God, to draw near to God and his presence in the temple and to obey God's instructions. But as is often the case, the people didn't generally respond well to being told that what they thought was genuine worship didn't actually honor God, that it was unfaithful to the God who had called them to worship and that it was essentially idolatrous. And so the messenger, going back, coming back to our story, the messenger from Assyria sort of pokes the bear. Hezekiah believed that he had restored the people to true worship in Judah, but the Assyrian officer says what the people are already feeling, likely. You say you trust in God, but how is God going to hear you and respond to you since Hezekiah has come through and torn down all of your special altars and your shrines to him? This is essentially what he says. Why would God defend you when your king has insulted him like this? The messenger is pitting the people against Hezekiah, their king, for Hezekiah's attempt to lead Judah back to faithful worship. And he does this in an interesting way by validating their sin as acceptable to God, and at the same time, by calling Hezekiah's faithfulness a form of sin. This is the very essence of propaganda, to, to sort of appeal to or attempt to manipulate the emotions of a people by, by validating the very worst parts of them. And so this is then where the story actually gets pretty hilarious, because Hezekiah's messengers are standing there and they're talking to, to the Assyrian uh, a general uh, official and they hear the, the rhetorical power of his message. He has brilliantly and persuasively brought together the truth preached by their own prophet Isaiah uh, married together with the distorted desires of the people and Hezekiah's messengers can sort of see over the backs of their shoulders where the citizens have begun to gather on the edge of the city, on the, on the city walls, and they're listening to this figure. And so rather than refute this messenger, rather than say, you're wrong and this is why you're wrong, they do something else. They politely ask him to stop speaking in the language that they understand. His response, they say, could you please just keep it down a little bit? We don't want the people to hear what you're saying. And so his response is to actually then sort of look over the messengers he's talking to and actually to begin to announce to everyone, these people that are on the wall, uh, to say, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Hezekiah's leaders don't want the people to hear this. But this is exactly the message that Isaiah has been preaching through this entire book and that he desperately wants the people to understand. This is where Isaiah's message started uh, during the reign of King Ahaz and it has stayed the same ever since. Do not trust in a king to deliver you. Do not trust in a king to deliver you. Whether his name is Ahaz or Hezekiah, and this is where we have to step from almost true to true. Hezekiah cannot deliver Jerusalem. 
but God can. For too long, God's people in the story have been unable to distinguish between God and their king. They've been unable to evaluate the actions of their kings. And so this is the way that it plays out. If Hezekiah cannot deliver you, well then he must not be on God's side. Therefore, we're doomed if Isaiah and the Assyrians are telling the truth. But if God does deliver you, then Hezekiah clearly was right and faithful, and therefore that is why God delivered you. This is the thinking that we find in these people throughout Isaiah leading up to this, to this moment. The people cannot imagine a scenario where God delivers people without the king's help or the help of the king's military. And so this is the problem. We've already heard from, uh, from Bob and Elijah who read for us the end of the story. God does intervene. Uh, one morning, the citizens of Jerusalem, they, they wake up and they look out over that same wall. And what do they find? The army is annihilated. They're gone. Defeated. By the time this story is being retold, by the time it's written and people later are rereading it, Jerusalem has been delivered. Which in their minds, because God and king are pretty much the same thing, Hezekiah had to have been the good and faithful king who earned God's favor and who caused Jerusalem to be delivered. When we read this story, we can understand how people think like this because we read in 37, 15, the words of Hezekiah's prayer. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord of armies, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, all of the kingdoms of the earth, uh, you have made heaven and earth. So incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all of the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. And then we hear God's response in verse 35. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Hezekiah prays that God would rescue Jerusalem, and God does. It's as easy as 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? Except what if it's not? And the rest of this passage sets out with a single focus. These stories are intended to train its readers to discern the difference between God and the leaders of God's people. These stories train God's people to move beyond overly simplistic feelings or impressions to rational and wise understanding. Let me connect this with our experience. We live in a culture that is training us constantly and from every direction to make decisions and to offer opinions free from any sort of thought or explanation. When I started thinking about the, the ways in which this happens, I immediately went back to the end of high school. There was this rating website uh, that became really popular. The site was called Hot or Not. And you could just rate people. That's all, all you do. You just page after page, score one to 10 on their hotness or notness. <laughs> uh, no context, no information, nothing. Just how strongly do you feel about this person's picture? And that's evolved over the last decade so that now there are dating apps on your phone that let you swipe right or swipe left if you're interested in someone based on a picture and a brief profile. People are, are making dating decisions based on a single photo intended to attract attention, right? First impression. Apps like Goodreads let you rate a book, but they don't require you to actually say anything about the book, about the content of the book. Is it four stars because it's written well? Uh, was it a creative idea but poorly executed? Uh, were there some profound themes developed in the, who cares? Just tell me how many stars it gets. And, and anyone who's ever read the same book twice knows 
that you're sort of feeling about a book is actually heavily dependent on all kinds of external factors, like what kind of mood I was in that week. There's a website called ratemyteachers.com, which lets you rate your teachers, right? A again, without any requirement that, uh, that you say anything about that teacher's actual ability. Anybody want to know what, what ratings our, teacher our teachers in here got? I got good ones. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> um, and almost weekly, uh, pollsters release the, the president's job approval ratings, and they've been doing this for decades, based on this question. Do you approve or disapprove of the way that Barack Obama, George Bush, Bill Clinton, right, fill in the blank, is handling his job as president? What does that even mean as a question, though? Do you approve, like, how do you feel in this moment about that? Where's the question about the actual content of what a president has been busy doing? The best part about this is that, that we can consistently predict how people will answer that question, how people feel about the president and the job that they're doing based on their political party and their primary source of news, which is one more piece of evidence that, that suggests that people aren't answering these questions based on sort of knowing anything that this figure's actually done. If you're a Democrat, you side with your own. If you're a Republican, you have to oppose him. There are just, and these are just a few of the many examples that exist, examples where we are encouraged actively and where we are trained to have opinions about things and to share them that have no basis in any kind of verifiable da data or we're not asked to then provide that, that data, that evaluation. All somebody wants to know is, tell me how you feel about this. Tell me what you think about it. And that's counted as a sort of valid opinion on the matter. And Christians are some of the very worst offenders in this kind of sort of refusing to think about things, circumstances, to discern between what we think might be happening or we feel might be happening, to, to understand what is going on. And, and so here are a couple of examples that maybe you've said, maybe you've heard somebody say, I know that I've said all of these at some point. Something good happened to me, and therefore God must be happy with me. Or the opposite, ah, oh, this terrible thing just happened to me and therefore God must be angry with me. Or I did this thing and nothing happened, therefore God must approve. Or I tried to do this thing that God asks me to do in the Bible, but something bad happened, he must not have wanted me to do that. Or hey, look, there's an open door, this opportunity. God must have opened it for me. Or, man, this door closed. God must have wanted me to go in another direction. Each of these imagine that God is some formula to be figured out. He is sort of a, a formulaic uh, dictator of all of life's details so, who causes each and every little thing that has ever happened to happen exactly as it happened and could not do so any other way because God himself seems to be bound by the formula. But this idea ignores the overwhelming testimony of scripture that says that God has intentions. And he says to people, you should jump in on my intentions, but I will allow you to do otherwise. And God who occasionally intervenes when humanity seems to be uh, expanding too far beyond the freedom that we, we have been given. The way that this all then specifically relates to this passage this morning, chapters 36 through 39, is in the way that we evaluate our leaders and ultimately ourselves, but but were started here on our leaders. Whether these are church leaders or political leaders, we can learn from Isaiah's evaluation of Hezekiah. 
Isaiah is telling us stories about Hezekiah long after Hezekiah has died. And so whatever frustration people might have experienced toward Hezekiah earlier for all of his worship reformation and all that funny business, they've moved on from that because Hezekiah is now associated only with Jerusalem's deliverance. He is the Ronald Reagan of Judah. He is the one who everyone looks to as like the example of what it means to be a ruler for God's people. But Isaiah wants the people of Judah to see Hezekiah's ugly underbelly. They need to see it because their unwavering support and rose-colored adoration of Hezekiah is unfounded and it's leading them to make the exact same mistakes they made a generation earlier. The truth is, Hezekiah is not just the king who was ruling when God delivered them from the Assyrians. Hezekiah is actually a key reason why Judah eventually loses Jerusalem. And the way that, the way that Isaiah goes on to tell this story uh, is then important for understanding how that happens. This, is, this kind of adoration of Hezekiah is, is what Isaiah is trying to correct and hopefully correct in all who would hear it uh, after the fact. And so he does it with these two stories. The first one we, we heard, uh, we heard Bob and Elijah read for us. Hezekiah prays for his own healing. And the second one has Hezekiah showing off uh, his treasures to uh, this foreign nation, Babylon. You might think, well, what's wrong with either of these things? Maybe nothing or maybe everything. Because the most interesting thing about Hezekiah's prayer as we, as we read through it, as we, as we heard it earlier, is that there's a significant difference between this prayer and the prayer that he prayed when Jerusalem was being threatened. So if you look at chapter 38, verse 1, oh, sorry, verse 3, we read this prayer, please, O oh Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah then weeps bitterly. Right? The differences between this prayer and the prayer we read earlier, they sort of pop out. God, save Jerusalem for the sake of your name, for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your reputation in the world, so that people might know you and they might see your power and believe that you are more mighty than the Assyrians. Right? This is the prayer that he prays uh, for Jerusalem's deliverance. Compare that to, God, remember how good I've been and how faithful I have been to you. I'm so deserving of this. And then Hezekiah cries because it would appear he is afraid to die. He has heard God's word that he, his end is coming and he cries. And then in verse 22, we, we learn that Hezekiah has actually um, asked for a sign in the matter. So he's said, all right, God, I, I, I just... I need something more to trust that you're actually going to do this thing that you said you're going to do. And we begin to wonder, how come Hezekiah's unfaithfulness doesn't sort of have a, a larger uh, impact on those who, who keep looking to him? He's afraid of death. He's focused on what he thinks he deserves. He doesn't even trust God's word enough when it does come. And it comes several times to, to believe that he doesn't need a sign. But the craziest part about all of this, it's not that Hezekiah is untrusting, selfish, and afraid. Because when we read this, we go, dang, sounds a lot like me. Like, right? Do you, I don't know if you ever get that feeling. But so it's not Hezekiah's unfaithfulness. It's that God answers this prayer. This is the weirdest, this is one of the weirdest things to me in the entire Bible, that God lets Hezekiah's prayer change his mind, change his direction, what he's going to do. Uh, you read it in verse 2. Uh, do, do, wherever verse 2 is, there it is. Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you will die, you will not recover. Thus saith the Lord. This is a word from God. Hezekiah prays. God gives him what he wants. What? 
he announces that he will deliver Hezekiah and that he will recover. One might imagine that part of Hezekiah's public reputation has to do with Hezekiah's prayer life, right? When you see a guy who prays for your salvation, your deliverance from an enemy, and then you're delivered, you go, ah, that guy, he prays. That's some powerful prayer, and you, you sort of assign some power to that guy and his ability to pray. And then you find out that that same guy prayed for, 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 to live longer, and God gave him 15 years. You go, ah, this guy, he's unstoppable. God does everything he says. That guy can pray. But there, there's nothing in this passage to suggest that God has answered Hezekiah because of anything that Hezekiah deserves. You get the sense that God is just super merciful. That that's just who God is. God's like, you were crying. You're kind of, kind of a baby about it. And so uh, I was just helping you out, right? But there's a, there's a tragic downside to this and to what happens because it's not enough to evaluate Hezekiah's actions. We actually have to look at the long-term effects of what happened. Hezekiah was about to die. If he died, his, one of his sons would, would take over and would be king. Hezekiah selfishly prayed for more days, and God gave him more days, and in, or years. And in those 15 extra years, Hezekiah had another son named Manasseh, who was the worst king that Judah would ever have. The scriptures make clear that it is actually because of Manasseh and what Manasseh does that God Come, allows the Babylonians to come to conquer Jerusalem. Can you see how this plays out? Hezekiah, the king that everyone associates with their deliverance, is actually, in retrospect, the king whose selfish prayer results in Jerusalem's destruction. So, this first story announces, hey, all of you who are tempted to think that Hezekiah is the man, let me just first lay out how selfish and fearful and untrusting he were, was. And, and then on top of that, that Jerusalem's future destruction was partly his fault. So just keep that, that all in mind. But then we jump to the second story, which just makes things better for Hezekiah. Not really. Um, where we read, at that time, uh, Merodach Baladin, the son of Baladin, the king of Babylon, sent envoys. He sent a group with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and that he had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly. And he showed them his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all of his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said, what did these men say? And from where did they come to you? Hezekiah said, they have come from far away country, from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good, for he thought, There will be peace and security in my days. That's a terrible ending, right? Wait a second. He seems pleased that all of these bad things are not going to happen to him. Israel had one job to do in the world. From the very beginning, when Abraham was called, they had one job to do. Israel was to be a light to the world, and they were to be a light by their example, by the way that they lived with God in relationship, the way that they listened to him, the way that they were eager to obey him, when Israel struggled to do that job, it was supposed to be the king who would lead Israel in doing this. 
The way that Israel would be a light to the world is by living in such drastically different ways from the rest of the world that the nations would sort of stream to the land, would stream to Jerusalem with a curiosity where they would say, show us this God of yours who makes you live in such weird ways. With that accent too. <laughs> Here, you, you see the passage sort of opens with like an interesting idea. Isaiah has been announcing that this is what will happen when God's purposes are fulfilled, that the nations will stream to Jerusalem. And you get this word, the, the messengers from Babylon have arrived at your city. And there's a sense in which, yeah, this is getting going. God is, is working. The nations are streaming to Jerusalem. The envoys come. But it's interesting because Hezekiah isn't interested in introducing his visitors to his God. The God who delivered them just a generation ago, he's interested in showing off, of his, showing off his treasures. Rather than entice these neighbors to come and know Hezekiah's God, these neighbors are enticed to come and steal all of his stuff. He see, they see what, what he had, and, and he sort of plants this, this seed in the Babylonian people. Those are people that we need to keep our eye on because they've got lots of stuff for us to take. And so it's announced that these neighbors will take everything away. And then Hezekiah expresses his relief that it's not going to happen under his watch. And, and the truth is, people are so short-sighted that without Isaiah reminding them that this happened, they would ultimately forget that Hezekiah was responsible for planting the seed among the Babylonian people. Hezekiah prayed selfishly and he showed off his own glory. And as a result, Hezekiah was just as responsible for Jerusalem's destruction as Manasseh, as the later kings, and as the people. Isaiah needs the people to be able to evaluate their leadership because in looking at the faithfulness or the unfaithfulness of each of their leaders and being able to look at Hezekiah and say, these are the good and faithful things that Hezekiah did and these are the less than faithful things that, that Hezekiah did, they will then be, be equipped to look more honestly at themselves, to take a much more honest estimation of who they are and what it means for them to follow God more faithfully. Ultimately, the people are, are to be able to do this work of evaluating faithfulness in their own lives. And, and I think most of us would sort of say, it's really hard to do that on our own. And this is one of the values of a community like this, of churches, of small groups, of, of households, because it's often these communities uh, of trust where where people can say things to us uh, that call us to a more faithful way of living. Uh, in the last two weeks, two different people have told me that I, I have the ability uh, to be condescending. Holy mackerel, that's hard to hear. In fact, I wanted to fire back, you don't know what you're talking about, which only revealed that not only can I be condescending, but I also don't take criticism very well. Uh, <laughs> but if Israel's kings can undergo this sort of scrutiny. Surely we can too. So that when we say as a church that one of our core values is, is faithfulness, it means that, that we have a different set of priorities in our lives. That we're not ultimately concerned with whether God preserves our lives or Ultimately, that he heals us from our sicknesses or that he would fill our storehouses with treasures. What we want above all else is to be found faithful. And as we come to the table this morning, we're reminded that we want to be faithful because that's who God is. That, that God has demonstrated his faithfulness to his creation and to his people from the very beginning in this constant and ever-expanding, ever steadfast uh, kind of way that's just, it's, it's unimaginable. And so when we desire faithfulness, when we desire to be a, a people who are faithful, we desire to be like the God who has been faithful to us. We desire to be faithful to the God who has delivered us. And so as we come and as we take the bread and we drink the cup, we, we announce the story of God's great deliverance of all of the world, offering his son 
so that all might be forgiven, so that, so that all might come and respond, repenting and, and coming to God and finding their lives uh, bound to his. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to sing uh, one more song. And, and as we, we do that, um, I just invite you to, to think about what it means to, to see in Hezekiah a man who was both faithful and unfaithful. And to say, God, would you search me and would you know my heart? And would you confirm in me those places of faithfulness? And would you reveal to me those places of unfaithfulness? And as you do that, would you help me to uh, not want to be that anymore and to repent and to, by your spirit, walk in the newness of life? Would you stand with me as we, as we sing together?